dashboards, how to make them support impact. And so that's what this next time together is. Helping you, or my goal at least for everyone here is that you leave this room, like you can better understand how to leverage and use dashboards. It's not about just creating a dashboard. Within a week, if it's just a dashboard, it's forgotten about, it doesn't matter, it's a whole bunch of uh, waste of time really and, and resources is what it ends up being. So how do we effectively use uh, dashboards to support initiatives, business objectives, desired outcomes, performance, operations? It is not, whoop, we got a dashboard, everybody go home. There's a framework that we're working under, a goal that we're collectively working towards, and dashboards will be one of many things that help make that happen, that help track success over time, uh, that drive eyeballs to a particular initiative. So that's what we'll be talking about. But my goal for you all is about impact, using this in a useful, relevant manner. Before we get too deep into it, I'll tell you a little bit about me. Uh, Juan Vasquez, again. I, uh, by day, I am the data programs manager at the city's office of finance. We are a 300 person city department. Our main responsibility is bringing roughly $4 billion to the table every year towards the city's annual or uh, general fund. That's roughly half of the city's yearly budget. And we do that through city business tax permits, collections. So uh, all of the city's businesses are supposed to register with us, entrepreneurs, contractors, freelancers, uh, all of that good, uh, good stuff. We also handle 33% uh, of the city's collections. So if someone, feel free to join. Uh, okay. Uh, the, um, we also do 33% of the city's collections. So if someone gets a DUI, goes to city attorneys, uh, there's damage to city property, stuff like that, we also uh, are responsible for that. So as a department, we like to say that all leads road, all roads lead back to finance because we do interact with all departments, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses in LA. Uh, nights and weekends, I teach data analytics and data visualization classes. You will see elements of those classes here today. I teach them at a school in downtown called General Assembly. They also have campuses in um, all over the place, really. Uh, it's, a, it's a school for working adults. So if you just want to get a little better at data, but you don't want to go get a graduate degree, like I've chosen not to do, then please, like, explore these professional development opportunities. Not all of us can just quit work and you know, go get a degree, that's not realistic. But can you spare a Wednesday night every month to work on your own professional development? Probably. And so General Assembly lets you do that. I also do contract work. I work with um, Annenberg Foundation and First 5 LA to do custom map-based data projects. So uh, I started out as an advertiser about 10 years ago and uh, worked in advertising for roughly three years. I've sold software to the Spanish speaking world because I'm Colombian by birth. And uh, I've spent the last four years working in local government. I work with Mayor Garcetti as a lead data strategist. And now um, I get to have a lot of fun with business data at finance. A little bit about me, uh, but it's important. The important thing there is I tackle my data projects from the intersection of all those experiences. So I'm a strategic communicator and a designer and uh, a, you know, a, a devil's advocate when I'm building my dashboards. And I encourage you all as either the, the supervisors, leaders, managers, or the builders of the dashboards to approach all of your business problems from uh, kind of that intersection of experiences and uh, different flavors of, of you know, what it means to be a human and do the work that we all do. Here's what we're getting into today. There's two, four, six, like nine little buckets or lessons that we'll be touching on. Two of those are activities. Uh, the other three really are uh, small lessons where we will look at if you are in a place in your initiative where you think a dashboard is, is really like the next logical step for your team to tackle, what's the intention behind that? It is not build a dashboard because the mayor said build a dashboard or the GM, there needs to be a business reason to do that. So how do we explore the intentionality in this? Um, once we've decided to build a dashboard, what are the ongoing expectations? Is it something that we look at once for a half day exploratory session with key stakeholders? Or is it something that every two weeks someone will have to reference? And what about all those dynamics that come with, with those discussions? The last thing we'll talk about anatomy. So we need a dashboard. How, how does that happen? We are not just like, boom, we have a human being. Like a bunch of things have to happen for a human body to come together. Same for a dashboard. So we'll peel that apart. Uh, the first activity will be short and sweet, just sketching out some fun charts, answering a question or two. The second activity, we will be sketching out uh, an actual dashboard uh, using an existing data set that lives out in the interwebs. So that's our roadmap for today. 
I've had a good amount of coffee. I get excited about these topics. I naturally talk fast. So any questions before we dive into it? Cool. Feel free to stop me if something isn't clear. If I get in a roll, uh, please just ask me to slow down and I will. What's a dashboard? Um, in my opinion and in work, it is a number of independent data visualizations that come together to help us identify actionable, specific, relevant insights. It is not, boom, here's a bar chart and like the biggest thing last month. Again, business problems matter, what, uh, what we aim to discover matters, and it is important. These are individual little analyses that we're conducting and stitching together. So uh, for those who might not be very familiar with dashboards, if you make a request that someone in your team goes build a dashboard, um, understand the, the work that you're asking for, and it is building a little structure. It is not build one thing off the bat. So it's important that you understand it's a number of pieces coming together like a big puzzle. Um, I found that kind of inspiration and food for thought is good in these things. So we're gonna explore a few dashboards, just like three or four examples. We're gonna spend maybe two or three minutes doing this. Uh, the first one that I'm going to show you is very busy. It is something I built now about two or three years ago. And the use case for the dashboard that you're about to see uh, is we would, my, my supervisor and myself would go and sit down with roughly seven departments, each in their own scheduled time, and we would meet with subject matter experts at that department. And we would have really thoughtful, in-depth conversations. So this dashboard you're about to see is busy because the audience are subject matter experts in the discipline and the subject matter, right? Like, so they know their stuff. If your audience is not going to be subject matter experts, this dashboard would be entirely way too busy. Additionally, last caveat, you're going to see interactivity. It's, it's a GIF that is basically looping. Uh, the reason for that, it's a little hack that I found. Many times you're presenting a dashboard, you don't have Wi-Fi, maybe you don't have Tableau on your machine or whatever. You can uh, export screenshots of your dashboard showing different clips of it, stitch them together, and you get uh, this. So this is built on Tableau. Tableau is a business intelligence tool, and this looks at the worker compensation, workers comp cases and employee injuries for a particular department across a period of time. The top two rows show tickers, so it's different numbers over a span of different times, comparing time intervals, basically. Uh, the like middle 50% is a series of bar charts and line charts looking at time and categories. And then the bottom third is just high level metrics, tables, numbers, and all of these started as individual visualizations that get stitched together to help subject matter experts try to dig at trends as to why are employees getting injured? Where are the injuries happening? What time of the year are these injuries happening? And you can replace injuries with anything. It can be sales, it can be registrations, it can be, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, so that's one example. Also know that I will be uh, sharing this with uh, School of Data, so they will likely be emailing everything out to you all. You got a few more examples here. Uh, if you ever want exp uh, inspiration, I recommend you go to Tableau Public Gallery, just Google that, and it's a world repository of dashboards built by people from all over the place. They have a, a visualization of the day, so it's uh, wonderful new things. This dashboard has nothing to do with government or workers' compensation, uh, but if you want to figure out where you want to travel this summer, here's a dashboard for you. So if you want to go, uh, you know, assuming you're in France, you can select things in the middle, like you really care, sorry, give it a second. You really care about culture. And so we can play with that dial. Maybe we really care about nature as well. And so you see that results start surfacing uh, based on the criteria that I'm inputting. That level of interactivity is important in a dashboard. If there's no interactivity, then it, it's really an infographic. It's, it's a flat, static experience. Dashboards imply a certain level of user experience and interactivity. And you have things like, our, like we're seeing here, where if a user takes an action, the results change. That, that specificity in interactivity is really important. Here's another example, keeping it light. This is one of my own projects. Uh, last, last year, the World Cup happened, and I was very upset. 
that uh, ESPN and Univision and Telemundo were just reporting, you know, rows and columns of the countries. So I scraped ESPN's web data, pumped it into Google Sheets, uh, just like an automated flow. And this map right here tracks the, track the eventual winner, which is France. And so if we zoom out, you'll see that all of the countries except two, the first and second place teams are reds. And so as the World Cup progressed, um, I tracked this and shared it on Twitter. Uh, we see an example of bar charts to show categories, uh, high kind of sum aggregations. So dashboards can be very fun. They don't have to be super serious. Here's a dashboard that Mayor Garcetti uses. A number of departments report into it on a monthly, quarterly basis. Not all of the metrics are updated, which is, um, a very real challenge that maintaining large dashboards over time, that really, that happens. You have staff turnover and we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, endless metrics, right? At some point you have to wonder how many metrics are too many. Uh, and the maintenance of this can definitely be a toll, but it is important for a large organization like the city of LA, 45,000 employees, 40 plus departments, 4 million residents, and the list continues. You, you need a lot of metrics to really understand what's happening. Uh, I got one more example for you. This is, this is what I encourage you all to view as dashboards moving forward. Typically, we're used to a dashboard being like a horizontal experience with some sort of matrix layout. Uh, think about adding layers. So this is built on Esri ArcGIS. Likely all of the municipalities represented here have some level of access to an enterprise Esri account. If not, there are free accounts to run pilot projects on but this is a layered web app. And so each tab represents uh, a different analysis, a different look at data. Uh, you can blend a whole bunch of data in here. You can blend boundaries that represent maybe neighborhood councils or um, census tracts down to really small units, zip codes, counties, and blend in your own data. Um, I do teach on this at my own classes and you'll have some information on, on that later on in case you wanna go or wanna send some of your staff. But what's really cool on some of the hacky stuff you can do here, uh, this middle section, all those dots, that can be anything. So you can build a dashboard in Tableau, publish it to the web and integrate it with Esri, or maybe it's a video. Maybe you need a static image that just really captures a human sentiment. And that middle section can be anything. So don't think about dashboards so much as a horizontal uh, or vertical experience where you just click into a handful of boxes. Think about how you can have dialogue and narrative and take people through a layered experience where there are specific insights that start to pop. Don't leave it up to your user to decide, how am I gonna peel this apart? If they're an experienced user, very comfortable with the subject matter, it could be a very smooth experience, but if it's, you know, depending on the person and where it lives and all that, it, it could be a little bulky. Uh, one thing I did not share with you all, some of my work, I built uh, the cities, what we like to call the legal weed maps. And so this is uh, a web-based application that if you input your address, it will show you the closest dispensary by traffic or foot. And this is a tool we built to help people, in, uh, encourage people to buy from legal licensed dispensaries. So um, this also runs on Esri ArcGIS. And so this is part of uh, DCRs, the Department of Cannabis Regulations website. I've also done a bunch of work for our own website, the Office of Finance. In your own time, I encourage you to check out finance.lacity.org and go to this button, do it yourself tools. I built a whole bunch of little uh, widgets and mini applications in here that are very helpful and good you know, examples. You can download it all and, and play with it yourselves. Okay, that concludes our kind of dashboard tour. We're going to get now into intention, but any, any initial questions or thoughts uh, on, you know, a few of these dashboards that we've seen? Cool. cool. Yeah, good. Yeah. Excellent. So let's talk about intention. I find that in government, we forget about intention sometimes. So we just go do things because that's how, you know, people tell us or it's how it's been done, but taking a step back and being like, why, like, why are we doing a dashboard or why are we maintaining this multi-million dollar program that whatever, like the why starts becoming really important, especially when it comes to using people resources and technical resources and time. And then there's an expectation from someone that might not be that familiar. So being, having a strong why is important. 
So I found three kind of main areas where having a dashboard begins to make a lot of sense. Uh, one of them is where you need to create some sort of web content to summarize how an initiative performed or you want to draw attention. So this can be something, it's a dashboard that lives on your website that can be part of a newsletter program, that can be part of monthly updates of social media content that is supposed to build awareness and support for what you're doing. Notice that I'm not starting with transparency and accountability. It doesn't always have to be about that. Dashboards can be a tool of engagement. They can be a tool to get people excited about the work you're doing. We in government do a bunch. Like we do so much, we serve so many people. And I truly believe most people in government are smart, thoughtful, and very capable. But that gets kind of forgotten and ignored with the preconceptions of government and where politics seeps in. So I find that it's super important that we actively share our victories, our successes, um, how our work manifests out in the built environment, which is typically where we all operate and dashboards are great for that. So think about dashboards as a positive thing that helps you draw the types of attention, the type of attention you want. That's, that's one bucket. The other bucket is you have a group of people like the, the mayor's homelessness task force, or uh, that's one example in, in my world, or uh, we've legalized commercial cannabis and now we have like 30 departments trying to figure out how enforcement pans out. Where are problem areas? At what point do you send building and safety versus LAPD? Because if you're that cannabis owner, very different experiences, right? Especially when we consider skin color and, and status, right? Like, as, as leaders in our city, we have to be thoughtful over what resources we use when. And a dashboard is a great way to bring all of those entities together and every three weeks dig at insights together. And so that's one thing that I myself guided and showed the mayor and the entire cannabis task force. Hey, here's where we're seeing the complaints. And then people go have conversations, they make decisions and they don't need to visit that dashboard every week, right? Like we don't need, now an engineer or an analyst to be extracting the data and refreshing it on a weekly basis, it might be okay to do it on a quarterly basis, a week or two weeks before that big meeting happens. And then the, the owners of the dashboard get smart on any new insights, the conversation happens, decisions are made and then reset, right? Like that's a, a very real workflow where dashboards are a key piece in a very long workflow. Uh, the last thing, which is probably what most people associate with dashboards, it's a, a tool or a mechanism of transparency or accountability. It is basically a tool that says, are, are we meeting success? Are people doing the things they, is money being spent how it's meant to be? Um, it's a little different than the, my, my first bucket of, of engagement. It's not about, hey, look at all the great victories we're doing. It's about, am I doing my job right? And, and that we're talking about intention here, that is important. So it's like performance dashboards, is it a, a research tool or is it an engagement tool? Those, I found those three areas to be kind of where, where a dashboard uh, be, begins to make a lot of sense. Few, I got a few more things for you all and we're gonna jump into the first activity. A few things that I encourage you all to consider. Uh, we've talked about decision-making, so having dashboards be something that helps you make decisions. Don't have it be the thing that makes the decision. It's the tool that helps you. Make sure it's connected to an existing effort. Don't, just because it's cool, don't just go send your programmer analyst to go build something that has no framework wrapped around it, no, no expertise outside of the technical expertise. Make sure it fits into something that's already in place. Um, like I mentioned, you need some sort of technical, you gotta at least be able to turn on the computer, right? Like even if you don't know anything, you, you need some level of technical expertise, and we're gonna look at a, at a diagram of tools and, and their technical need, but you do need, you gotta work something. Uh, and a sense of time, right? Do, if you need a dashboard tomorrow, don't build a dashboard, because you're not gonna have enough time to make sure it is correct. Do you have a week, a month, three months, a year? If you need it in a year, you probably don't wanna build it right now, because it's gonna be, out of date by the time you actually need it. So really think about time and be critical and intentional with it. All right, that's it for the first lesson. We're now going, yes. How much data 
how much raw data, how many data points do you need to make an effective dashboard? When does it make sense to do something else? Uh, that's a great question. When do you have enough data? The, the very real answer is you can have as many as one row of data or one billion rows of data. It is more about in your business operation, when do you have a need to look at the data you already have in a different way? Like when, when have you stopped finding answers? When, when have you run out of questions? Or when are you stuck on a question? That's it. There is no moment that says, oh, our database is now big enough for a dashboard. Um, I mean, sure, I, I guess if you, if you need a range, I would suggest at least, at least 100, just being totally arbitrary. Um, but the real answer is it's not about how much data you have, it's about when, when do you need answers in a way that you're not currently seeing? Uh, and, and we will talk about tools based on data size. You don't always need a Python developer if you have a 50 row spreadsheet, right? So we'll, we'll get deeper. Into, does that help a little bit for now? Yeah, I'm working with nonprofits and trying to teach them the value of this. And the complaint is always, well, we only have like a year or we, or we don't have too much. Yeah. You know, they, it's, there's always pushback. So I'm trying to give them that the, the, you know, then the default answer is if you got data, we can build a dashboard. If okay. it's a matter of helping the entity and just getting them to take a step forward, yeah. if you have a spreadsheet, you have enough data. If you have a PDF, a piece of paper, right? Like anything you can get started with. Oh, any other questions? That's a great question. Okay, first activity. Uh, the first part of this, you just need your brain and your voice. The second one, you will need the sticky notes. And so I just need you all for yourselves to verbalize a current business problem where you think a dashboard could provide unique insights. And here's an example. In my data analytics class, in my free time, we do an exercise where we pretend we're Netflix and Netflix needs to figure out what show to recommend to viewers once they finished an existing show. And so we look at the correlation of shows. So that's Netflix, that's not city government. Uh, for us at the Office of Finance, we need to figure out how to better convert people we think are businesses into actual registered businesses. So take a minute in your heads, think about it, and then I would like two or three people to just share an example. All right. Before we move on to the second part, can I get um, one or two people to share their, if it, do we need more time? Can I get two people to just share? One of, yeah. Um, we always struggle as a public agency to get our contracts out. And so um, having a dashboard that shows kind of where each contract is in its procurement process mm -hmm. uh, could really help share information to better catalyze, you know, teamwork and getting things done. That's an excellent example. Uh, in my past life at the mayor's office, we, uh, my team was tasked with analyzing our procurement spend so we could create the chief procurement officer. And turning a dashboard uh, lens over your procurement practices opens up a whole bunch of savings opportunities. And it shows a lot of spaces for where, where do you have like a bunch of the same things? Who's, so that's an excellent use case. Uh, one or two more examples. Come a little closer to the mic, so uh, the folks on the webinar can hear. Uh, we have a lot of health inspectors on the ground, mm. and we want to determine if they're doing good quality entry work and having a similar experience, or that each, say, restaurant is having a similar experience across mm. various different inspectors, because mm -hmm. we want our inspection process to be fair and equitable to everybody, but we don't really have a way to measure how desperate we are. That, that's an excellent example. Are, are we, uh, where are we allocating our typically most expensive resource, humans? Or like, where are those human resources going? Is our service equitable? Like, I love that that word came up. Are we giving service in an equitable way that makes sense for the populations we serve? Um, we, one effort we did in the past, uh, we built a dashboard for our tax compliance officers, the people that go in and track with businesses, and we analyzed uh, zoning against the size of the census tracts. And so we looked at historically, when do we have high conversion rates and which census tracts tend to be way bigger than what a human 
or two people should be able to cover. And so we try to find the sweet spot where we have good enough conversion rates that can improve, where the physical space those human beings are going to uh, m like make sense for two or three people to tackle. And so it can definitely play a role in, in resource allocation. Know that the city's zoning layer is available through the geo hub. And so if you ever wanna know more about census tract size and is this residential or commercial, because many times we have functions that only need to focus on residential or commercial or industrial, the zoning layer can be an immediate resource right now that is totally available to anyone with internet that can, you, you can use in some human uh, like built environment resource allocation. So thank you for that example. Okay, uh, that's good enough for the first part. The second part, you all should have uh, three or four sticky notes. All right, I'm time. Cool, three or four sticky notes. Uh, we are, I'm going to ask you all to build three simple visualizations. It can be a pie graph. Here are some examples. Uh, a pie graph, like we're, we're used to seeing. Uh, I know some folks have very strong feelings on pie charts. Uh, maybe a timeline or a bar chart. There's a number of visualizations. Uh, you just need to build three individually, one per sticky note. Drop a title that you'll remember what you did. But here's where it gets a little silly. You need to build three visualizations based around this scene. And this is a, a Where's Waldo scene. And this is my uh, challenge to you to take the seriousness and stuffiness out of dashboards. Because in government, it can become very real, very serious, very quickly. And we do very serious work. Like we, our work impacts people's lives. But in learning, we can be silly about how we pick up these tools. So build three visualizations based around this scene. And that could mean anything. Think about what you're seeing. You're seeing colors, you're seeing shapes. Waldo is somewhere in there. So you know that there is at least one Waldo to whatever number of people are in there. Um, there are animals. There are uh, people with a lot of clothing and little clothing. There's uniforms. There are physical structures. There are plants. There are human beings and robotic beings build three you are your own ceo in this case you are your own little mayor you need three visualizations about this where's waldo scene you will get fired if you don't <laughs> it is super important for next year's budget so you have about five minutes to build uh three visualizations do not let yourself get stuck Okay, you're not being graded. This isn't going in the mayor's annual report later on in the year. Just push yourself to visualize three silly things. All right, let's start wrapping up. Last 30 seconds. And then uh, clearly I'm not gonna ask people to present their tiny, tiny sticky note. Uh, but I would be curious to hear just from two people, uh, what is one thing they chose to visualize? So we got last 20 seconds. And then after this, we will be diving into uh, expectations. That will be a very small lesson. And then uh, we'll look lastly at the anatomy of a dashboard and that will have a, a bit of a longer activity for us. Pencils down, pencils down. You can finish this at home if you're so compelled to, but for now, join me back up here. Uh, can I get one volunteer to share verbally what what um, anything in this scene they chose to to visualize? Yes. Nice. Side. Interesting. Okay, thank you for that. Can I get one more volunteer? Yes. Um, I'm kind of a bit uh, confused by it, but I I work in uh, uh, ethnic minorities and uh, and uh, and white. Uh, um, and then I was on mainly like female in this class now, and I was like, and it seems to me that there's a great participation if you see of uh, men, especially men in uh, uniform, mm -hmm. and uh, and also uh, black people because it's female, 
as well as we do uh, in ethnic minorities. And also, I also looked at the, if we look at what the resources around here are going to be, and like if we look at like food resources hmm. and the concentration of people around that. So that's good. Very interesting. We need better gender equity uh, services at the World's Waldo headquarters. Uh, but that's interesting different takes. Uh, last one, can you, you do maybe just one or two, not the whole three? Uh, I divided it by part one. Oh, interesting. That's great. Did you find that there was more concentration in any one quadrant? Okay. <laughs> Cool. All right. Thank you all for sharing. I appreciate you all entertaining. And the um, we can be silly. We can have fun with the way we learn how to be better at our very real jobs. So thank you for being silly with me. We talk a little bit about that. You'll see this a little bit later. So uh, any questions before we move on to the second point of of expectations? Okay. Uh, and, and the expectation part is a decision has been made to make a dashboard. We now have the intention for it. We know why we want it. We have some sort of framework or initiative where it's going to play a role in it. What do we expect to happen once it's done? Um, what does our audience expect to happen once this first iteration of the dashboard is done? As I mentioned in the use cases, sometimes every three, three months you gather and discuss. And so every three quarters or every three months, you need new relevant data. So in you thinking about what is expected of this dashboard, consider these three things. How often is new data even available? For us at the Office of Finance, we only get the, the amount of tax we collected once a year because it looks at the year prior and there's a particular time in the year forward where that metric is actually available. So if, if the mayor wanted to know how much business tax are we collecting on a quarterly basis, that's not going to work because the data actually isn't available. So in expectation management for yourself, for your team, for your end user of the dashboard, which is typically not one and the same in the cre like creation team, uh, just think about that baseline and use that as a guide in your conversations. So the request might be, I want to see every three months this metric. Ask yourself, is the data available every three months? If not, push back and, and it's okay. And then, may, oh, okay, maybe a lot of times the requests are like artificial numbers that just someone wants in a particular time frame. But if we probe at it, you realize that there's flexibility. So once we've determined how often data is available, we need to assess how much effort is needed. Many times we think, I want a dashboard, and so I need one thing, right? Like, boom, here's my dashboard. What people don't realize is that a dashboard might really be like 500 tables, right? And from those 500 tables, you need one column from one and a row from other, and you need a SQL query that asks, uh, a server to retrieve and you know we'll, we'll dig more at that so don't think of a dashboard request being one thing typically it's like a bunch of pieces of data that need to come together um, and this last point i think it's super real for us in government retirements are happening at a higher and higher rate uh, and that means that there's i think expedited turnover and uh, at some point in workflows you might have Maybe your engineer is going to leave. Maybe your developers who, who pulls the extract, the database administrator. Are you going to have key turnover in the next few months that is going to make it difficult to maintain this dashboard? And if so, is there anything you can, you can automate so that maybe the technical part, like maybe we don't need to always write the same queries. Like maybe there, there are pieces of it that can be automated without sacrificing human labor. It's just a matter of orienting the human labor into you know a, a different level of production or a different type uh, but that is something that we should definitely be asking are we putting workflows in place where someone who's going to leave in six months and 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 if so how do we deal with it so a few considerations that are important there uh, last two how is it accessed and using what devices so on the left side of the screen are you going to host it locally is it going to be locally grown is it going to be something that lives on a machine or can it live in the cloud in the interwebs in the inter it does or, or is that a local file and there's security reasoning for that is it if it lives in the cloud then does it have to be accessed publicly because if you're going to build something in tableau for example you can only host 
in the cloud in two ways, either totally publicly or you have to have a $10,000 server. And I don't think many small agencies have their own $10,000 dedicated Tableau server. And so in those cases, what do you do? Okay, maybe you can install Tableau Reader on the person's tablet or monitor or phone. Are they gonna be interacting with this when they're driving from one point to the next and they have like eight minutes and so they just wanna check metrics on their iPhone or their Samsung? Or is it a tablet? Or is it their big screen monitor at their office where they're gonna have three uninterrupted hours to probe? I don't know. You all as the, the leaders in an organization or the creators of things, uh, those are the types of questions that inform how a product is created. How will it be used? Maybe you need a, a I mean, I hate flat PDFs, but maybe you need that to accompany this one-time dashboard. And then you, you need to like play out all of the scenarios and how this thing will be used. Uh, and that's determined by your audience. So really think about it. What devices does it need to live on? And, and uh, you know, again, does it need to tr like be available in a computer, in a phone or a tablet? The very important considerations. Not everything just boom is automatically responsive. I have built things that are too bulky to fit a phone. They weren't designed for a phone. They were designed for a, a group discussion around a big projector. So really think about that end use and how it will be played. And, he, that, and that's it for expectations. It's just how often is data available? How hard is it to get it? Are key pieces of my team leaving? And how is this all gonna be used? Very important. The, the public versus small group versus individual access, we really need to prioritize cybersecurity uh, and privacy. So uh, identifying, is it one person, five people, an entire unit or division, or every human being with internet access? Those are typically like the levels that we can play with. Let's talk a little bit about anatomy. Where are we on time? Yes, we have about 35 minutes. Kind of, 30. Uh, dashboard anatomy. But before we jump into thinking about dashboard anatomy, just uh, close your eyes for a second and let's think about our own anatomy. So think about if you have your hand, um, is it just your hand or is it composed of tiny bones and skin and veins and blood um, and all of tiny pieces that make our hand be our hand? Um, a little more meta and philosophical, but what about thoughts? Like, are thoughts part of our anatomy? Is our intention part of our anatomy? I think that past a certain point, those intangibles become a part of it. So that's what we're gonna play with. When we request a dashboard or wanna build, you can open your eyes. <laughs> what? Don't fall asleep on me. <laughs> when, uh, when we're saying, let's go do a dashboard, like how do we piece that literally together? So let's think about this. Uh, just. This uh, flow that you're seeing starts in the top left corner and ends in the question mark. And so take a second, read through it, and then we're gonna break it down together. Okay, so this is what I propose as the road to a dashboard. As I've said before, intention begins this whole process so a literal verbalized business problem that is one or two sentences that you can share with a teammate with a supervisor with the cafeteria person who knows nothing with your spouse with your roommate with your dog two sentences that can just be quickly shared that if the person speaks the same language as you can understand it without them being subject matter experts so once we've verbalized our problem and, and uh, have a, a sense of what we want to do, we got to go get the data. And as I've, I've mentioned, just because we request a dashboard, you know, that it's not one thing. It's many, many tables, rows, columns coming together. So we, we have a verbalized problem. We go get our data. Great. We got our engineers or our open data portals or our intranet. And we now have uh, in my case, when I, I built the city's real estate portfolio of city-owned assets, we had 55 different data sources, 55 different files, different standards. Some were totally full, some were empty. Crazy project. But we got our data now. We got our data. What do we do? Well, we go explore. We go take a stroll around our neighborhood. We see how many columns are in each file. 
how many rows. And I'm sharing this with you. Most of you all here are probably not going to be doing this work, but you're going to be asking other people to do this work or you're going to be encouraging the organization to do portions of this work. And so this is the part where you need to understand what a dashboard entails in like the literal way of getting to a dashboard. So we've explored our data. We've now cleaned our data. After the data is clean, you go to pen and paper. So we're at a point now, in, once we're like at the end of, of the first row, where we're going to finally start thinking about what does this dashboard look like? That is informed largely by what your data shows you. So maybe you start this process thinking you want like five maps, but then you realize that maybe two maps and a timeline and a chart or a bar line is what you need because that's what the data allows itself uh, to present. So we have a business problem, we get the data, we explore it, we clean it, then we sketch what we envision our dashboard to be. That's the activity we're gonna be doing in a minute. We're gonna explore a data set together and we're gonna quickly sketch together what we envision a dashboard could be. Okay, so we start with pen and paper uh, because it is a time saver, not because we wanna be artistic, but because it is uh, wasteful time-wise to jump into your screen and start trying to design things as a brainstorming pathway. It is way harder to be like, oh, let me change that and now I gotta like resize and you go down very deep rabbit holes. I found that pen and paper is the fastest way to get common kind of ground and agreement on the direction of a dashboard. So always sketch before you take it to a screen. So at this point, uh, we're at the end of the top half of this kind of dashboard deconstructed journey. We have our clean data and we have a sketch of our dashboard. Now we need to decide what dashboarding tool we will use. And that's, go that's gonna be the next slide where we're gonna get a sense of the universe of dashboarding. Uh, but this is important. Notice that you don't clean your data typically in the same uh, environment where you prep your dashboards. Sometimes that happens if you're using Excel or Google Sheets, but if you're using Tableau, Esri, Microsoft BI, you're gonna wanna clean your data before you pump it into those tools. I advocate for that. I found most data practitioners do that. Um, some of these tools allow for some level of data cleaning, but it, it, it is more cumbersome. So uh, keep that in order. Let's say we've decided with Microsoft Power BI or Tableau, now we're going to build the individual visualizations like we did with our friend Waldo. So that's a key part of the dashboard. You don't just build your visualizations into the dashboard, you build your visualizations and then you stitch together your dashboard which takes me to, we have a dashboard, it's done, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. Then we, we gotta present it to a group or we gotta teach a group how to use it for them to use in their own time. So there's another human component. It starts with a human component and kind of ends with a human component. So once it's been presented or the users are taught, then that's kind of like a, your own adventure. Is it a quarterly thing and then it's a separate workflow? Is it something that just lives on your website for a year? I don't know. Uh, but this is what I propose as a great framework for when you're thinking about getting on a dashboard project. These are the typical steps that guide that. The, for example, the way we do it at the Office of Finance, we have a data engineer who provides us with the Excel file or CSV file. Uh, in my case, I work directly with Zach and a few other people and he writes the SQL query based on the criteria given. And he is the most technical person. He's extracting the raw data. From then on, it's either people like me who are not a data scientist, but I can work with Python a little bit, and people that have very little data experience doing their own reporting. So for us, it starts with a highly, highly technical person and then quickly goes to someone with very little spreadsheet experience, things like that. So it, you can totally have some, you can do some of this cleaning in Excel and Google Sheets. Like it, it can be, very complex or very simple. Um, and we'll see that in the next slide. Any other questions? Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah. Okay, any other questions on this? Okay, so here, uh, here's a bit of the, the universe of dashboarding tools. The uh, more rightward we go, the more complex these tend to be. So always start with pen and paper. That is always your first dashboard prototyping tool. Uh, and then some of the more common tools that are out there where you can do dashboarding and cleaning, Google Sheets and Excel. Um, Google Sheets has a data studio layer that you can do very real dashboards or in Google Sheets, you just stitch together functions like 
uh, you know, VLOOKUP with uh, validation and you make like a Frankenstein dashboard for ad hoc, small scale workflows that can totally cut it. If it, you're talking maybe about a four person unit that doesn't carry a lot of, um, you know, desired outcomes, you can, you can definitely build lean, small, manageable dashboards in Google Sheets and Excel. I find that those don't scale and that you have a lot of issues with version control. So as you become a bigger organization or your data gets bigger, I know that's a question that came up earlier, at some point, these common, some many times free tools just don't cut it anymore. So in those cases, there's a big space comprised of business intelligence and data analytics tools. Tableau, as I've mentioned, I work with that a good bit. They have free options, online options, Tableau servers, desktop. Um, Esri ArcGIS, that's actually my favorite tool. At, uh, Esri ArcGIS Online, it's totally free and you can build a more map-based dashboarding experience. Uh, many of us in government have Socrata contracts. Socrata was recently bought by Tyler Technologies, uh, but that's a very real tool that many agencies have. Microsoft Power BI, more affordable than Tableau. Uh, Periscope Data is one of many uh, tools that lay over databases, typically SQL databases, and just help you visualize and build dashboards. So th this is definitely not an exhaustive list. There are many, many more um, in, in the BI space. One step beyond that though is if you have technical resources that can work with code, Python and R are great, great languages for visualizations and creating kind of packaged up dashboarding experiences. So Python has the matplotlib library, pandas library that help you visualize. And then you probably need an additional library or framework to wrap it all together. Uh, but that code vertical is, is by far the most technical, of course. You don't need to live there. Like most organizations can build great dashboards without having a, a Python developer. Any, yes? What is the online tool did you say was free? ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online. It's excellent tool. The city's GeoHub runs on it. Uh, there, a lot of their conferences happen in Southern California because they're based in Redlands. And um, it's, it's a great tool to like try out and pilot phase and, and like scale up. So. Any other questions on this bit of the layout? Okay, our universe. All right, we're coming up on our last 25 minutes. Uh, so we're gonna skip this, we talked about it. We're gonna jump into our last activity. Uh, before that, though, I wanna feed your brains with a little bit of thought on, on, sol on colors and symbols and shapes. Uh, those elements make up dashboards. And so uh, I encourage you to challenge your definitions of color. Blue isn't just blue. There is a wealth of tones and transparency and gradients that you can, you can play with the idea of solid colors. Uh, additionally, be simple in your shape selection i find that many times icons are like people gravitate towards icons because they're shiny but they create noise so unless you have a lot of data features i encourage you to stick with simple shapes starting with circles continue soft edges create less noise than hard edges like squares um, and so don't use symbols unless you have a lot of data and you're at a point where you need to further categorize how you visualize that data so it's we could talk about like design theory forever uh, but let's poke a little bit about color selection. So I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but, but depending on your culture, color has different meanings. And so don't just assume we, we live in a highly diverse community, right? Like people from all over the world and it's a massive city, massive region. Uh, make sure that you're aware of the color selection. And so uh, one thing being government, we have to embrace accessibility or we get sued, like for real people get sued. And so uh, consider if you don't have a default reason in your color selection, I tend to default to blue and orange because based on now almost a decade of working with designers, it is, I was taught that it was the color scheme that creates the most contrast. And so there's a ridiculous amount of people that have some version of color blindness, most, more than we would assume. And that color scheme, blue to orange, is the one that I've been taught generates the most contrast. I'm not colorblind, so I can't prove it, uh, but that's the default. So um, consider that colors have different meanings and how color impacts accessibility. 
we had talked a little bit about this next activity, you're gonna sketch out a dashboard. Uh, I had shared some visualizations with you. You're going to need to choose a few of these because uh, we're about to explore a data set together and just gonna quickly sketch out a dashboard based on, on the fields that we'll look at. Uh, but there, if you point your attention to the radar chart in the top right corner, I had only ever seen this playing video games where the, if it was like a sports video game, that's, I played a lot of FIFA growing up, a soccer game, that's how uh, an athlete's skills were shown. This is the first time, uh, oh, sorry, hold on, where is it? Um, 538 is a great data-driven news and blog site. They use that same radar visualization technique to look at 2020 uh, presidential candidates and their appeal. And so here's a, a good definition of, uh, please do not try to create these radar charts. They're very complicated and typically don't come out right. But I thought it was an interesting look at a, at a complex visualization chart or style with kind of pretty timely topics. Okay, this takes us to 1023. We have 20 minutes and I wanna have about 15 of those for our activity. So um, any last questions before we sketch out our own dashboard based on existing government data? Yes. Um, uh, can you recommend like a site where we can actually, um, you know, um, see like samples of like really good dashboards? Because we found we find that in our in our organization, that's usually where we get stuck is like these designs. Like often, you know, there's no problem with creating the data. We have good mm -hmm. analysts that can create those data marts and all that as far as source of data. But we usually get stuck with the design because we're business, we're systems analysts. Uh, by skill, yeah. so we don't really have those design, design. whatever, um, design uh, skills. So, you know, we either just gravitate to pie charts or bar sure. charts, vertical, horizontal bar right charts, here. you know, so um, oftentimes our dashboards just look the same from one thing to another. Yeah. And, you know, so we want to make it look um, aesthetically pleasing sure. as well to our users, but that's usually where we get stuck. I hear you. Uh, so I, for me, I, Tableau Public Gallery, is always a great place to start. You don't have to build in Tableau. You, maybe you build in Microsoft Power BI. Oh, this is in French, sorry. <laughs> Tableau Public Gallery, people from all over the world are publishing up to it. Uh, additionally, let me give you this resource, hold on. Oh, this is in my computer. <laughs> yeah, especially like when you're, uh, we're trying to um, illustrate like three different um, measures and under like in one chart, it's yeah. like, you know, what's like the best way to depict that? Um, write down this shortened URL. It is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash JV tools bit.ly forward slash JV tools. And this is a shortened URL that points you to, it's my own personal kind of running list of resources. So I have like 40 things in there. So for the sake of time, just like this is a great place for all things tech resource. Um, additional URL, so bit.ly forward slash JV tools. Additionally, bit.ly data viz in LA. Bit.ly forward slash data viz in LA. Uh, this takes you self selfish uh, personal plug. This is my class schedule. So if you want to learn more about this, I got a few classes coming up a General Assembly over in Little Tokyo. And, oh, uh, crap. There we go. Okay, so let's jump into uh, any last questions before, because we're, we're definitely coming up on time. Okay, so this is where we're going to, yes. Oh, for sure, yeah. Okay. We have 20 minutes. Let's see if we can quickly do this. Uh, what we are about to do is explore 
the active businesses data set. And so this is a, an open publicly available data set that my department refreshes and publishes on a monthly basis. It houses all of the registered active businesses in LA. It's a little over 500,000 records. So the size of it is probably similar to some of the data sets your agencies work in. I believe it has like 16 columns. It's got geospatial information like zip code lat long. It's got text, it's got numbers. So it's got a varying data types that allow us to play a little bit with our visualizations. We're going to explore it together very quickly, maybe three to four minutes. And then we're gonna give you 10 minutes to build your own rapid dashboard in the scrap paper that I handed out. So does anyone need more paper? No? Okay. If you need more paper, feel free to use more here. I'm going to ask that you keep it simple. We'll do three visualizations again because dashboards can be that simple. Uh, think about using location as a, a framework for one of your visualizations, a category, and the idea of time. Okay, so uh, write those three things down, location, category, and time, because we're now going to explore this data set together, uh, and I'll probably leave it up so we won't see these three things again. Location, category, and time. Try to play with those three ideas in your visualizations. In government, we typically have those three kind of data types. Uh, zip code, lat long, address, council district, uh, or some sort of categorization, or actual timestamps. And uh, the data set we will use is one I'm very familiar with. Uh, I've found people really like it and has a lot of uses. It is available through data.lacity.org. This is one of the city's open data portals. It is a great example of what a municipal open data portal can be. As soon as it loads. Uh, this one is like the, the open data portal of record, but know that there's a second one, geohub.lacity.org, that prioritizes spatial data. So uh, that's, but it doesn't have all of the data that this portal has. It's a website, really, is all it is, and it, it houses data and information. And to explore, we'll just want to click in the top data catalog. From here, it will present you with data sets in order of views. It's a little bit of a popularity contest. We'll play with the second one, listing of active businesses, but a quick point on building and safety information. This data set is a great indicator of where change in our built environment is happening. So for folks that do work around uh, displacement or beautification, or things that impact either new or long-standing business owners or homeowners, this data set can provide some really unique flags in where change is happening in our very large city. That's a separate conversation though. So let's click into active businesses. And we're gonna explore this together for about two minutes and then um, we'll start sketching. All data sets that you access through an open data portal will, will first land you on this type of page. This is called a primer, and it's meant to provide a summary before you're like inundated with data. It gives you a brief summary of what you're looking at. Notice that it will tell you what agency owns it and how often it's updated. If any widgets or tools or applications have been built with that data, this application here is an example of that. So this is something we built for our website at the Office of Finance that helps business owners figure out what their account number is so that they don't have to clog our phone lines for a very simple question. What's my account number? So here they can type in their business name or DBA. Oh, I gotta renew my registration. I should be in there. Uh, and so one example of how, you, this is called a data lens page. It's one of the features offered by Socrata. And so it sits on top of an existing data set. And so it's just, a, it's just a, a really easy way to segment and explore a raw data set. We're back to the primer now. Notice a few more things about this data set. We already talked about when it's last updated. This is very important. I like to not work with things that are outdated. Um, you will also want to check how many views. You know, typically if it's an older data set, you want it to have a lot of views. How long has it been or how many times downloaded? And this is very important. How many rows and columns? This gives you a sense of the real estate. Is it huge? Is it kind of big? Is it pretty small? Uh, and lastly, you get to see all of the columns that we will soon see. 
So let's explore this before we go into the spreadsheet view, which can be more overwhelming. We have 16 columns and we have things like an internal account number. That's a number we create in the Office of Finance. Or actually, we have a column name, a description, and a data type. Data types are very important because they dictate what can and can't be visualized. You cannot aggregate letters, right? Like, what's A plus B? Unless you assign it to a number or a numeric value, it's, it, it's not going to work for a computer. So it's important to consider things like this. Uh, so let me call out a few unique columns. Uh, notice that there's a business name and a DBA name. Sometimes they're different. Sometimes DBA is blank. Notice that we have a specific complete street address, an individual city. Many times we are within the city of LA boundary, but it might be cited as totally separate cities. We have a zip code. It might or might not have the four, five plus four. It might be only the first five number of things there. We have a mailing address, which is different than our business address, right? Business owners don't always live in the same place they do work. We have a NICS code, which is a, a and it categorizes the business type and business service. So we have that as a number and as a word description. Then we have a council district, which is a bureaucratic boundary. We have 15 of those in LA. Uh, and then we have two dates, one of which is when was this account started, seen as a day, month, year. Uh, and I believe there might also be hour in there. And then location end date, which is all empty because these are active registered businesses. So this entire column here is empty. Lastly, in location, you have latitude and longitude, which is a, a numerical representation of a physical address. This building has an office, or this building has an address, but if we squash this building and turn it into five little houses, this address won't exist anymore. There'll be five new addresses. Uh, however, the latitude and longitude of this location cannot change regardless of the structure that's in it. And so, in think, just quick plug on spatial data, if you're gonna be working with addresses, do your best to get latitude and longitudes. That process is called geocoding and it, it creates, it leads to higher levels of integrity in your data. So if you can work off latitude and longitudes, that's great. Okay, I think I've talked too long. We might not have enough time to sketch. So we're gonna explore the actual data for two minutes and then you have seven minutes to create three sample visualizations based on the little bit of data that we're gonna see. You come up with your own, just like with the Waldo stuff, have the freedom to decide what numbers might be what, uh, but let's, let's look into this. I know you all have screens on your computer, so take advantage of the proximity of that. The location number, I'm just gonna scroll slowly and let you all. Is the location number unique to that business or could there be another business next to it? Which one is the identifier? It's that. that location account connects to the specific business location. So if you're a, a chain that has three locations, each one will have its own location account number. And uh, there's something in the way that number is created that bundles them all together under one entity. Is the NIS, N-A-I-C-S then, the company that created the location, is the N-A-I-C-S the exact company? No, that's the business category. N-A-I-C-S, NICS code, is what type of business service do they have? I'll scroll a little bit more. We see the address. Notice that DBA is pretty empty. We see zip codes here. Mailing address, location description. So, so remember, we want to create three visualizations. One of them should play with the idea of location. The other one should play with the idea of time and the other one with the idea of category. So in thinking about location, maybe it's a map of the entire city with a bunch of dots, or maybe it's a zip code or a council district or a specific address. Um, so just take the time to sketch out three things. Fill in, if you have questions, fill in the gaps with your own answers. Okay, just choose three of these columns and stitch together uh, a bit, prioritize one of them since we only have three. Prioritize one of them and like just sketch it out in, in your own dashboard. Here's what next codes look like. There's the numeric version.
So here's a good look at some of, so here you have um, some location information, some category information, uh, time information. All right, let's start wrapping up. Um, I appreciate everyone that followed along. If you didn't finish, it's okay. Uh, it's 1042 and I know there's more sessions starting, so I just wanna have a chance to wrap up with everybody. Again, I, I teach some of this stuff in my free time. So if anybody uh, would like to join or better yet, send, send your staff. Um, you know, I, I, I encourage everyone to be as data literate as possible. It just helps our city and public entities be better. Um, I hope you all got what you expected out of today. I hope there were actionable, useful learnings. Um, there's most definitely an entire lane of conversation in how to effectively present dashboards, um, things like that, that, you know, time constraints, I, I thought it was a little better to focus on the beginning part of the process because I find that in government, we put a lot of emphasis on the end, but then we, if we don't think about the beginning enough, uh, it just becomes a pain. So um, there's more to talk on this topic. I encourage you to seek out more resources. I gave you one of the links wrong. Uh, the correct link for all of the web resources is as follows. I will include it in the presentation. It is bit.ly forward slash tools JV DTLA. So it's very close to the other one. Um, I, I've just, version control is an issue for some of us. Uh, so it's four slash tools JVDTLA. Yeah, because that's where I teach mostly. So four slash tools JVDTLA. Uh, I appreciate your attention, your time, your ears, your brains. I hope this was helpful and useful. Make the most of School of Data. Uh, and have a great day. Thank you for your time. Thank you.